Hey, thanks so much for inviting me on this show. It was fantastic. We talked about perseverance, never giving up in life, and and uh, passion and honesty and integrity in what you're doing. If you if you go down uh, through life like that, uh, great things will come to you. So thanks so much for having me. Hey everybody, Matt Rosenthal again on digging in. Uh, awesome, awesome guest today. You know, I say that at the beginning of every show, and it's actually true. Every show we have an awesome guest. Today's guest is really unique. Uh, his name is Greg Devlin, and I think that you're going to find some just some cool, cool stuff. You know, going on with 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 Greg and his background, and what he's doing now is really amazing. But let me just give you a quick background to set the stage on what what he's done because it's it's just amazing. Uh, former U.S. Air Force sergeant and explosion survivor of the largest U.S. nuclear weapon. So he's going to talk about that. He's one of eight men who were awarded the highest medal given during times of peace, basically the Cold War. Uh, it's called the Airman's Medal for heroism. He's going to talk about that. Um, and something that I really like, I just I like so much about him, and we're going to hear more about it, is his, um, the fact that he's a family man and his, his wife and his daughters and his grandchildren. He has a reason why he does what he does. And, and he believes his life was spared that night to serve others, to serve his family, and that there's just a purpose for him being here. So, Greg, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Matt. <laughs> Hope I didn't set the bar too high with that intro. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It is going to be a lot of fun. And, and one thing that I, I, so I gave a, you know, that's, that's your background, but, you know, behind you, we see that there's a lot going on. You've done you're doing some pretty cool things. I do want to go back to the beginning and I want to have you tell your story. But before we do that, just talk about what you're doing now, what everything behind you is, and give us a little, little taste of that. Sounds, sounds great. So uh, right behind me over here on the, uh, I'm not sure if so left or right of your screen, but anyway, right okay. behind on this side are the, the good guys, which are the Neon Tiki tribe. And Tiki means thoughtful, intelligent, kind individuals, okay? Uh, so our goal was to create a group of superheroes for kids that uh, instead, of instead of just action, excitement and laser powers and explosions and things going on, we wanted when the end of the episode, every single story, every book we write, we wanted a real life value for kids. So something that they, that they got out of it, whether it was perseverance or uh, stranger danger. So they weren't getting car with cars with people they didn't know. Uh, body image, it says, you know, you are, you are great as you are, you know, just we're, we're, there's only one of you in the world. So, so, so be proud of who you are. Uh, so 13 episodes, okay. Uh, these are the good guys. So Zeke's the leader, Tia, the girl's the smartest one in the group. Uh, I, I'm married and have four daughters, so uh, you know where I got that from. But uh, anyway, the girl's I have two. You, you got two. All right. Yeah. Um, Moa, the greats, the strongest of the tikis, and then um, Dar is the fastest. Okay, they have laser-powered sunglasses. Uh, make a lot of lot of things happen uh, that way. So uh, back here are the evil Ku Tiki tribe. Okay, and it originally started with just four, which was Brackus, who was the leader. Uh, Pyra. So if you notice, there's one, for, there's one for every uh, good one. There's a bad one, right? Uh, Pyra who shoots flames, uh, Hookah who blows smoke. Uh, we don't want kids smoking and stuff, but uh, and then we got Garmo who is the largest of all. He, he could actually get bigger. If he put his glasses on, he actually got really big. So massive, you know, and then, uh, but then we brought a character in called Kunados and he's the most evil mean of all the, of all the uh, Kutikis. Okay. And he's so mean that that group actually at one time in the beginning had banished him. They, they tricked him and banished him into an island. He couldn't get off of it for a long time, but they realized that they couldn't ever defeat the Neon Tiki tribe. So they said, well, maybe we have to bring him back. We don't like him, but maybe we have to bring him back. So that's Kunatos, okay? So these are the new version of the Neon Tiki tribe. And uh, Matt, this is a 30-year project. 30 years okay um it's you know it started originally i'll just show, take you back so imagine thir 13 books uh you know that stranger we got stranger danger we have uh 
Ethan Sparks Trouble, which is a fire safety book for kids. Uh, Gigabytes of Disaster, which is internet safety, you know. Uh, don't meet somebody off the internet. Don't give them your home phone number, you know. Uh, this one's a bullying book here, okay. So we have, we have 13 fan, fantastic books, but it all started with one book. An original version of the Antiki tribe was nonviolent action heroes. Okay, we tried to kind of run with that. Where if it, so, if, so people would say, "What do you mean a nonviolent action hero?" I said, "Well, they had six laser-powered sunglasses. Like green was the power of a was the power of a vine, so they could shoot it out and tie you up without killing or harming you." Okay. Um, orange were, they were explosive glasses. They could blow up a, a condemned building or maybe a crack house, but they wouldn't work if someone was in it. We didn't want somebody getting hurt, but we did want to create the action and excitement, right? Blue would be the power of water or wind. So it would water hose, big water cannon would keep you out or maybe uh, flood them there. So you can make some things happen, right? So that's what we envisioned in the very beginning. Um, and we, so, so you uh, all 13 of those books you created. Yeah. So, so here's how, here's what happened. So initially on this book, I created this, this storyline of, of the where the, and th this one was, by the way, I live near the Kennedy space center, Titusville, Florida. And there's a, there's a, a place that actually exists here called the enchanted forest. And, and it's, and it's real and it's right here in town. And um, so we placed it there at that forest. And what was happening was these guys were bulldozing trees illegally. I don't know if you can see any of that. Yeah, right? I can. Yeah, yeah. You see the lightning bolt and the yeah. sunglasses. So, so what happened was um, they're bulldozing trees illegally. This big storm blows in and lightning and all kinds of stuff going. The construction workers are running. And the head guy, a guy named uh, Zablecki, that guy with the hat on, right, with the red construction helmet on right there. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yep, they can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, his glasses blow off and they wind up in a pile of palm trees that have been bulldozed. So the very beginning was where the glasses wound up hit by, struck by lightning. And then the entire pile of trees starts to glow neon. Sunglasses were everywhere, by the way. I mean, hundreds <laughs> of sunglasses, right? right? And, and the Tiki's wore multiple glasses called yeah, that. Yeah. But, but anyway, so, so they create the neon Tiki tribe, right? But what we found in our journey, so we, Matt, and this is a crazy journey. We, we had stuffed toys. We had this book, Think Neon. We had beanie tiki's. We had, uh, we had t-shirts. We, we were in 23 Walmart stores, 23 Walmart stores at one time. We had over $1 million invested and this project ran out of gas. It what didn't wow. become... And, and I'll tell you this, to be honest with you, I think a lot of it was on my marketing skills. So I, I kept thinking, uh, and this was a, I think this was a mistake, but I kept thinking, um, so, cause we were looking to partner with somebody. We were looking to partner. We were looking to get a publisher for the book. We were looking for um, a toy manufacturer to take over with the toys. We were looking kind of for a partner. And I, I, I used to always say, if I was Steven Spielberg's nephew, Neon Tiki's would have been all over the world a long time ago. They just would have. You know, if you, if you get to the right people, big things can happen, right? Well, nobody knows me. I'm in Titusville, Florida, and we got this. And originally, by the way, so I created an initial concept. It was, and then it was my wife and I, and then my sister and brother-in-law, who kind of finished this story. That was the original beginnings of this story, was remember the bulldoze trees and all of that? Well, you know you know my background, um, because- We're going to get to it. We're going there in a second. Yeah, so I don't know if I'm getting off track for- No, that. no, wait. So, so prior, this whole thing is, your, is a, this is your creation. This is your idea. Yes. These were things that were probably bouncing around in your head for like a long time. This didn't just happen. No. Um, and it turned into 13 total books. Yes. Yeah, that, that's pretty amazing. And what you, where you took it, and even though it got, it sounds like it stopped at a certain point, it's still pretty amazing where you took it. And, and you're still working on it. Oh, yeah. And we, you know, Matt, we toured children's hospitals with eight foot costume characters. We had six songs. We would go into the uh, Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital in Orlando. We've been to the Shriners uh, in Cincinnati, the oh, Burnside. Wow. Yeah. We've yeah. been to Tampa Shriners. 
uh, Los Angeles Children's Hospital in Dallas and Oklahoma City for the bombing victims. I mean, we did a, a massive tour with these big eight foot costumes, but I kept thinking someone's going to see us and go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you guys came along. Let me show you the way to take this <laughs> where it becomes a television series and, and books and toys and games and all that stuff. And it becomes a superhero series that is better for kids. We wanted something better. Hey, I grew up with Superman and Batman and all, you know, uh, well, then the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles come along, you know, with, for my kids' age group. But, um, so, and they're awesome. They've all, you know, they go, and they're still out there. You know, superheroes never die. They're, they're there forever. So, but we wanted one where it gave a real life value to kids. Every story. So, you know, that was kind of the goal. It was like, how do we make what a purpose yeah. when you were describing it before and then we're going to talk about your background a little bit when you were describing it in the very beginning you said perseverance uh, there's so many things that i think you and i can relate to from our own lives <clears throat> that kids don't necessarily see or have access to or experience it's just different times yes. so Children do need to be exposed to things that give them confidence. But one of the things I thought of when you were talking is also the idea that you're good enough um, yes. underneath it all, because that's one of the most common uh, self-defeating beliefs that people carry around with them is that they're not good enough and it drives everything in their life. Exactly. Exactly. We, so one of their books, uh, by the way, that's now this is the new version. That's these guys here. Okay. Right. This is where they come to, but one of our books is called Tia and the Amazing Mirrors. Okay. And this is a little girl. She's she's a, a very short, okay. And this I want just want to tell you the in, a little information on this book. I had a sister. Um, I had three sisters, okay, uh, all younger. And the youngest one was Kathleen. She actually died at five months old of today. They would call it SIDS, but my mother said back then they called it pneumonia. They didn't. They didn't even know. They didn't know. Actually passed. Yeah, but but anyway, um, Kathleen had achondroplasia which is, so it's short limbs, short legs and short arms, but normal body width. So we want, I, I use, and this little girl's name is Kathleen, okay? My mother's name is Monica, and she's actually the, uh, this little girl goes to the um, festival and, you know, she can't ride rides because she's too short and she feels down about herself. But in, and it's called Tea in the Amazing Mirrors because the very back end of this book, she winds up the hero of the story, but it's because she has to track something down and she goes through the, you know how you go through the mirrors and make you look tall or thin right. or fat or yes. whatever. So she goes through there and then Tia, Tia's telling her, the girl I see in there, the heart and the, and the intelligence of this girl is huge. This girl, you, you know, you are, you are awesome just as you are. In the end of the story, she be, winds up becoming the hero of the story. And they find, and the message to kids is, you are great as you are. You know, there's only one of you. So, so be proud of who you are. Don't let anybody talk to you. Don't let anybody put you down. You know, so because we're all different. We are. You know, we're taller and heavier and skinnier and whatever. We all have different personalities, but we're all good at some certain things. And there's only one of us out there. So, so yeah. every book is along those lines of, you know, let's let's make kids the best they can be. Um, that's what Neon Tiki Tribe is really about. And Matt, we have, you know, we have 13 finished books. We have 10 more books right behind them. Our next book is going to be Autistic Kids, Our Heroes Too. Um, we have a teamwork book uh, kind of based around the Kennedy Space Center, a, the a space themed uh, teamwork book. Because, you know, the astronauts, and rightfully so, go through all the hard work and, and they kind of get the glory but they can't get there without the ground workers. They can't get there or get back without them. So this, this is kind of one of our teamwork books there is coming, but we, no, we have so many cool stuff coming, man. I watched, you know, it's on TV all the time. I watched Apollo 13 the other day. Oh yeah. It's on okay. every, it's on every single weekend, like on, on right. Run. But um, that one scene, like where, there's a couple scenes, but the, where they're just like, I forget the main character's name that works in that control room. Uh, mm -hmm. Ed, Ed's uh, the guy with the blonde hair plays him. Um, um, but anyway, he looked at everybody at one point. They're all the guys from Grumman were pointing fingers. Well, we don't know if it can if it can do this. And they're all like yelling over each other. And he just goes, stop. Solve the problem. 
solve the problem. And they all started to, and you just watch a series of, and I thought about my own company and you just think about people when they interact with each other. It's like when you have a common cause and you, and their cause obviously was to get these guys back. Right. It really is amazing what people are are able to do creatively, creatively, the the creative thinking, the critical thinking, the thinking outside the box when you need to make something happen. And you just reminded me of that when I watch it. I mean, I've watched it probably 10 times already the past six months. I can't pass it when I see it. Right, right. That's the ultimate story of perseverance. And like, no matter what happens, we're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. And, you know, I have a uh, one of the uh, in the very in the initial run. Okay first one nonviolent action here we we kind of dropped that theme on this one so we have action and the you can't say it's nonviolent, yeah. but but nobody gets killed in our story because the bad guys come back in every episode but but anyway um uh when we started with this story uh one of the guys that was had money uh, loaned to the project he he was a, a really good friend of mine but he became a really good friend of mine he's my business partner now a guy named dave thompson okay so Dave and dave and his wife run a janitorial service company in Indianapolis, Indiana. And they do a lot of the uh, car dealerships up there, big car dealerships. And um, so Dave was, he loved the concept of doing something better for kids. So when, you know, when the first one went under, you know, when I say went under, by the way, I never filed bankruptcy ever. All the money that was loaned to us, we consider it still loaned to us. Um, when we formed a new corporation to create this version of the Neon Tiki Tribe, it was called Worldwide Neon Tiki Tribe. The other one was called Neon Tiki Tribe. We, we visualize these worldwide. So we put a clause in there, and the clause said that we are not going to forget anybody who lent money to the first project. And the attorneys are looking at me like, are you crazy? You're going to put something, you're going to assume old debt? I said, well, all we're saying is if we can make this thing, thing successful, a lot of times these superhero series go on to generate, oh my gosh, Matt, billions of dollars. So, exactly. so are, you saying, are you saying, you know, to us, we thought, no, those people are valuable and that we would uh, kind of uh, come back, look at that and address that situation down the road. But but with the with the Neon Tiki's, we can't give up because of the kids. We can't give up because of the kids. So So, you know, that's kind of, you know, um, it's, it's just what, you know, unless, unless I'm dead, <laughs> <laughs> this is a mission. This is a life, life mission. We're not, right. We're not going to give up on the, on the knee. <laughs> okay. And by the way, when you see me looking down, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes. Uh, yep. 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 I got um, you. okay. You weren't, you, this is who you are now, right? And this is, this is, I'm like, I'm captivated. You got me sucked right in here. Like, this yep. is really interesting. So bring me back, right. t- bring me, take me through your life a little bit. This all probably stems from, I'm sure you had dreams and aspirations as a kid. You had your, your, your experience as a kid. I know you were in the military. Just, just take me through that a little bit. So, uh, and I'll go back just a hair farther. Okay. So I was a brother, uh, I was a brother with three sisters. All right. Okay. And, and my, and my parents, and especially my dad was, I always said, Hey, great. Don't let anybody hurt your sisters. Don't, you know, you, you're a big brother. You got to take care of your sisters. So I grew up. So then I, I wind up married and my wife and I have four daughters. So I've grown, my entire life has been defending women yeah. and, and I consider the elderly and, and children and anybody who couldn't defend themselves. You know, my, my family history is my grandfather was a professional uh, fighter. He's a flyweight in the 1930s, had 93 pro fights. My fathers and uncles were Golden Gloves champions. I became an Arkansas Golden Gloves champion. So, I, so as a fighter, a guy who's, um, you know, learns that uh, first off, anybody has the guts to get in the ring across to you is a pretty tough guy, no matter who wins the thing. And if you ever see a boxing match at the end, even as much as they may talk trash and then they hug it out. Yeah hate each other they hug it out don't they yep, yep. because it's just mutual respect but anyway so growing up like that is a guy who defends others and wanted um just just kind of keep that in mind so uh, uh my background was that which is growing up defending people and um you know i one of my man my really passionate things is on bullying because i don't think a single child on the planet nor a, a, an adult no one has the right to harm them, to push them around. So some people are fighters and some aren't. So what I tell kids is, I say, listen, you know, if it's okay if you don't want to fight, it's okay. But then, but you have to have another mechanism to defend yourself. 
So I always tell my grandkids, if one thing bullies don't want is they don't want you to make any noise about it. Or, you know, they want to keep it on the slow down. Interesting. I said, the first thing you do when somebody's pushing you, shoving you about the bully, you take your lunch money is at the top of your lungs, scream as loud as you can. Stop it. Leave me alone. I said, like crazy loud. I said, because what's going to happen? Everybody in the schoolyard, everybody in the hallway. Yeah. What the heck's going on? The bully doesn't want that. So that way you can at least get help. You, you know, scream out for help. But but anyway, um, so I don't want to get off topic there. No, that. no, that's cool. So you had so I just came back to your 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 I guess your grandparents, your grandfather, your father. Yep. Did they do that for a living or was that so my grandfather did it for a living from like 31 to 39? And back then, I don't think you're making a lot of money, but I still have his old, I have, it's so cool, all, all his records, you know, I have the fight cards from those nights and uh, the contracts from what he was paid. My grandmother saved them. And uh, so it was pretty cool, you know. Wow, you I, have all I, that. I, that is pretty cool. If you ever see my my garage mat from yeah. floor from floor to ceiling, everything inside of it, what I have a, a refrigerator and a freezer, uh, washers and dryers. I have cabinets in there. Every single one from floor to ceiling is every photo my family ever took forever. I have them eight by tens, four by sixes. They cover everything. So when I go outside in my garage, when I go outside, I get to see and, and people go, oh man, I checked this garage out. And I said, well, listen, most people have their photos on their phone or in an album. Nobody ever gets to see them. I said, I get to see my photos every day. So like people come over the house and go, oh man, check this out. We so, got to shoot this next episode too in your garage. We, oh man, <laughs> listen, and uh, if, I, if you get anywhere over here, what I do with everybody that goes in my garage, I take a selfie with them and then I print it out before they even leave. And then I put it on the wall and I have stacks of them. So what I do is you can, they're like stacked, you know, four, five, six on each photo. You can just go through them. It's, it's a trip, That's man. Cool. <laughs> but anyway. So you so, so they were fighters. You ended up being a fighter, but it sounds yep. like you and your dad didn't do it for a living. You guys had yep. other things going on. Yep. So mine was, so, so just, I just want to throw that boxing thing in there. Um, I'm I, glad you did. That. That's great. So I go, I go into service and um, um, I go into, uh, by the way, I met my wife when she was 12, I was 13. We dated four years. I married her 45 years ago. Um, and Wait, we you have, guys were teenagers when you got married? She was 16. I had just turned 18. We dated for four years before that. I met her. I have photos with her at 13 and she was 12 hugging her at that age so so for four years we were you know a very young couple and and we're and it just worked out we we're so glad you know you how do you know when you marry someone whether it's gonna work out you know and you got some, that, so you got married at that age you guys were married she was 16, 16 i was 18 yeah, we, this year will be 45 years but but wow. uh but anyway so young we get married Love young it. yeah um, and if you see my history i man i survived a hundred mile an hour car crash at 15 years old my buddy was 16 driving a 64 Chevy Malibu, four door, six cylinder. Um, I was the big mouth that got it started. I'm the one that caused it because a goofy 15 year old, what do I say? I look at my 16 year old buddy, my best friend and say, is this all the faster this lawnmower runs? So what's the 16 year old? <laughs> hey, I, know, I go faster. So, yep. But you, so you survived, you guys. Three broken ribs. You had your seatbelt on, I assume, back in the time when nobody was saying to wear a seatbelt. No, it was a 64 Chevy Malibu. I was sitting right in the middle of the back seat. They were in the front seat. As he was driving. His Those old cars had a hump in the back, right? Like you could sit uh, in no, the middle? No, no, it's actually a flat. It's just two bench yeah. seats, you know? But I was just sitting there, and I, I flo and then he floors it going down a hill and then loses control, and we hit a telephone pole broadside at 75 miles an hour. But it wrapped the car all the way around the pole like a horseshoe. It slid up eight feet high. They found blue paint came down, bounced off the pole, but it broke three ribs, punctured my lung, missed my heart by centimeters. So that's one experience. What about the two of them? Uh, knocked my buddy out. And then the other one got up laughing. He was like, oh my gosh. So nobody got killed in this car wreck. Um, you know, we could have all been killed. Nobody was killed. So, okay. so you take that. Then I joined the service at 17. And I go in basic at 17. 
I wind up working on the largest, I uh, wind up working on Titan II nuclear missiles, the fuel systems. And the only reason I picked the job- Wait, what, said, what, what did you join? The U.S. Air Force. You joined the Air Force. Air Force did, in 1977. In 77, and you, you had to relocate. Yes. So your wife I, was with you at that point, wherever you were going, she was going now. Well, I was 17 and, and she's 16. And I was like, you know, they were moving me from after basic. I went to tech school training, which was four hours away from Ohio. I was in Cincinnati. And then I would see my girlfriend every weekend. Well, I realized they're getting ready to move me 12 hours away from Cincinnati. I, I'm going to be without my girlfriend. And so I went to her mother and her, her dad wasn't in the picture uh, much then, but I went to her mom. I said, Dolly, I said, you know, I want Annette to go to Arkansas with me. And she goes, oh my gosh, Greg, I'm responsible for it till she's 18. But she finished it by saying, unless she's married. And I said, well, can I marry her? She said, don't you want to think it over? And I said, no, I have thought of it. <laughs> so the next week I You're came like, back. I just with, did. I came back with a ring. Well, you know, uh, we get married and, uh, and then we go straight to Arkansas. And she I mean, went with you. Okay. She went with me to Arkansas. She was 16 when we got to Arkansas. And uh, anyway, uh, so we get there and I wind up working on fueling the Titan II nuclear missile, 103 foot tall missile with a nine megaton warhead on top of it. I mean, it was 600 times as powerful as the bomb dropped on Hiroshima or three times as powerful as all the bombs dropped in World War II, if you include Hiroshima, Nagasaki, all the bombs dropped by Germany, Japan, and the US. One warhead was three times more powerful than all that. And, it, and that's, that's what I was fueling, at, you know, every day from a, as a young kid. So, you know, we're there and about- Wait, was, hold on, this is going too fast. This was, one, this was one missile? One missile was- That you that just described could, could do that to do that one missile and we had did, 54 of them there was we had 50 us had 54 of them so we had 18 in arkansas 18 in kansas and 18 in arizona and if they were going to be launched they would come out of the ground in those places and go wherever how far could they go russia uh, germany japan uh, you know we still have them so, so what do they, they do with them so let me tell you the story what happened All right, go ahead. So i'm there three and a half years working you get me North excited North. this is interesting Normal, normal young guys and girls in the service. That's what service is made up mostly of, of the 18, 19s and 20 somethings, you know, but, uh, but anyway, so we're there and they, uh, as basically a routine mission was going on on September uh, 18th of 1980. And all the guys were doing, they, they had been on duty about 11 and a half hours, but they said, hey, we want you to finish up one more job. All they were going to do is go over for lack, lack of better terms, picture of gas cap about this big. And so to, to, to take the cap off, you need a socket that big, eight pound socket on a three foot ratchet. All they're gonna do is break it loose, unscrew the cap. They will con connect a line off the wall to it, right? And then turn a valve and put a little nitrogen pressure on top of that tank. So the fuel's in there, but they're just gonna pressurize a little more. And then that would put the bird, they call it the bird, back on alert. Because if the pressure gets too low, then they can't launch it. So routine maintenance, I mean, I'm talking, uh, 30 minute job total time. So they go in only the socket separates from the ratchet, bounces on the platform, you're 70 feet up on the missile, bounces towards the missile and squeezes between the platform and the missile. And it starts falling, it drops 70 feet and it hits what they call the thrust mount, which is a big silver ring on the bottom that holds the missile upright. Bounces in, punctures the bottom fuel tank, it's pouring fuel out. Uh, 12,000 gallons of fuel starts to pour out of this. And Matt, this fuel is so hazardous. If you inhale it, it will kill you. If it gets on your skin, it turns to, mixes with the moisture in your skin, turns to acid and continues to eat you. I mean, it's, it's called hydrazine, uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, really bad stuff. So it's pouring, this is pouring out. It's pouring into the bottom of the hole, right down in the W. And they see this big white smoke cloud coming up. They go, oh my God, and there's no way to stop it. No way to stop the fuel from leaking. And still got that nine megaton warhead sitting on top of it. So they go back into the control center. All the flashing lights are on and the alarms are going off like there's a fire and all this. They walk back in there and tell them what happened. They go, oh my gosh. So SAC headquarters, 
pulls pulls the uh, everybody evacuates everybody for five miles. Even the launch crew was gone. Then they send the fuel guys, us, we were second shift team. They send my partner and I in first. So we suit up like, similar to an astronaut suit with its own backpack and air inside. And then we, Matt, there's only two guys in history to ever break in to a nuclear missile complex. That's my partner and I. We had to take bolt cutters, cut the fence that you would, normally they'd buzz you in. They'd open the electronic gate and let you walk in or drive your truck in. And then you would go through code control and all that. But anyway, we cut that. We take, we had great big bolt cutters and we had a crowbar and we had this uh, uh, vapor detector. So anyway, we're carrying all this stuff over. I'm sorry, we had a hydraulic pump. So we're carrying a hydraulic pump over there. So we're gonna break through a steel frame portal door, like a warehouse kind of a door. We find at 15 or 20 minutes, we get through there. You go down 35 feet and you get to a 6,000 pound blast lock door. Uh, it's, it's this thick. It's uh, uh, 10 or 12 feet wide and you know 10 foot tall and then you're not going to break into that with a crowbar so you have to hook up the hydraulic lines to manually slide the the pin back so that it would open so we're starting to pump the door open but we're running low on air they said you guys come back so they had us come back to top side we're standing about 80 feet away from a 740 ton silo door so the next two guys go into where we were finish opening the doors and they get to this panel and the panel, when they look at the panel, every light is lit. All the gauges are pegged all the way out, which means it's about to explode. So they look at that one. Oh my God, this thing's about to blow. So they said, come back. So as soon as they come back and get topside, so they're closer to the door. We're about 80 feet from the door. It explodes. And it the blows. Whole, the missile exploded. The, all the fuels inside blow this and even the nose cone of the missile because that's kind of a protective coating because the warhead what's inside isn't as tall as big as the nose cone that's actually the re-entry vehicle comes back and that's when it explodes on wherever it's at over in another country but anyway blows that in a million pieces blows the missile in a million pieces and it blows a 740 ton silo door 600 feet off the complex it's gone and it, it's held down by hydraulic pins this big that lock it in place. It blew it right off the pins, man. I'm standing 80 feet from it. I'm sliding 60 feet on my back with concrete flames and steel going past me. And Matt, um, I only had one thought. If you, uh, There's a book and a movie uh, my story is in. It's called Command and Control. So it, it was on Netflix for about four years. It's on PBS, uh, The American Experience, PBS. Uh, it's called Command and Control, but it's on uh, right now. It's on Amazon Prime and it's on um, YouTube. You can see it. But but anyway, you were at a per, you, you were at the point. OK, so you got knocked door, back. You, you see things flying by you. Yeah. And uh, when I, in the movie Command and Control, you'll hear you'll hear I say this, uh, which is I only had one thought in my brain when I slide and burn it because um, my, my I had no control over my bodily functions. But anyway, my arms wound up here, which really, as bad as my face was burned, it still saved my face because it knocked a lot of the flames off. But, um, but anyway, as I signed and burned, my left eye cracked open, and I could still see glowing steel that looked like lava going past me at a thousand miles an hour. I went, wow. oh my god, dude, it's over. I mean, my my thought was, I know I'm I know I'm gonna die. I just hope it's not painful. It's the only thing that crossed my brain, but. But I finally come to a stop. Wow, you remember thinking that at that moment. Yeah. It's the only thought I had, man, was that. It's like, it's over. I know it's over. Just I hope it doesn't hurt. But uh, as soon as I came to a stop, I hear a blood-curdling, high-pitched female voice. There were no women on site that night. Female voice screaming this close to my ear. Matt, it gives me goosebumps to tell you this. I mean, because I could feel her breath. She's going... Run as loud as she could scream, this piercing scream, long-winded scream, and she does it again. Run, and I'm going, oh my god! I mean, I turned to look because I'm thinking, oh my god, lady, who's next to me? So I roll over to look, and it's pitch black. There's it's three o'clock in the morning. There's nobody there. I went, oh my god, Greg, run! I jump up and take off running. I get five steps away. 
Let's see if I can show you this here. Uh, You're telling me there was nobody there. There's no, there's, well, there's no women on site anyway, but, but it's a female voice. So, you know, Matt, think about this. Cause I've had people say, what do you think it was? I said, I think it's a guardian angel, but I said, they said, who was it? And I said, I don't know, man. I mean, it's a female, it's a female voice. But I, then I started thinking back. I said, maybe it's my sister, Kathleen. You know, I don't know. You know, I can't, I, I'm not an expert in, you know, in uh, who that would be or whether that would even be possible. But were you able to get up and run? So, hey, so get this. So, yeah, because I slid on my back, man, I'm sliding burn, I'm burnt up and crap. But I'm telling you, at that point, I felt no pain. My brain, I was in a state of shock. And you're like your adrenaline's going, but anyway, I um, I'm gonna show you this photo. So, so this is me. I don't know if you saw these photos, but anyway, this is me. Can you see that photo? Whoa! Burn wow. my fa oh face, my neck, back, both hands. Uh, slid sixty feet on my back. Um, shattered my ankle, severed my Achilles tendon, broke my right eardrum. But anyway, so picture this: I'm sliding and burning. I hear the screams. I get up and take off running. I want to show you where I was laying. Your so, face healed perfect. Well, they came in every eight hours with a Brillo pad and they scrubbed the dead skin off everywhere on my back and hands and stuff. And it was in the very beginning, I didn't feel any pain. I was on morphine. I was like, man, I can't believe that doesn't hurt. About eight, nine, 10 days in, I was like, oh my God, it was so painful because they don't give you any more morphine. They give you the same amount, but your body builds a tolerance against it. But anyway, so picture this. See this concrete right there? Yes. Okay, over in the left corner over here is where I was laying. Right where the concrete, that far left corner is yeah. where I was laying. Yeah. Okay. So I'm laying. So I land there, hear the screams, I take off running, and I run. Now I, I can't see where I'm running, but I just take off running. Right. But I happen to be running in that direction, right straight across the screen to the right side of the screen. Okay. Well, see the steel rebar sticking out of that concrete? Yeah. Okay, so I get to about that steel rebar out here, and then I feel that thing, boom, hit the ground right behind me. It feels like an earthquake. I feel like I'm going to fall back into a hole because I'm going in that direction. I go, oh, my God, Greg, keep going. I don't know what's going on behind me. Just keep running. Well, the steel rebar that I'm holding right there, that steel rebar, 30-foot-long strands of it, which is this big around, comes whipping past and shatters my ankle and takes me down so now i'm just la now i'm laying there and i can't go anywhere and i just cover up in a fetal position and i hear chunks of concrete mat that were um oh my gosh man um I i'll show you photos but massive chunks of concrete bigger than school buses land hitting the ground around me man boom 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 and all that stuff used to be underground so so i survived this explosion i'm in the military you know I'm, i wind up 50 percent disabled when i wind up leaving the service and um wait how I, long did it take you to recover so so i had three years and four months in the service um before the missile exploded i was on a four-year you know four-year deal and then um so i it took me about uh six months to kind of get past most of most of the stuff, you know, they had uh, they did a skin graft on my left hand. They did put the uh, hand thing over it, um, you know, shattered ankle and stuff. Um, but uh, so about six months of total of kind of healing all that. But the, the military treated they didn't treat it so good afterward. I saw the writings on the wall. I was like, yeah, man, they were really embarrassed. They were mad. They were, you know, all the upper supervision, you know, guy drops his socket and blows the thing up. And, you know, they, they blame it, blame it on the guy, you know, they dropped the socket, Dave Powell, and, um, which that could have fell off on any one of us. So, you know, wait, just that. put this in perspective. This was yeah. in 1980. It was Ronald Reagan, right? I uh, know it was um, um, Bill friend. Clinton. In eighty? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Clinton was uh, governor. It was in the nineties. Yeah, it was Carter. It was Carter. Oh, it was Carter, and then it was. This must have been close to when. Yeah. This is during the Cold War. Yes. This is. It's interesting who was president at the time. So, so they tried to. So, was this a huge like national story? It was, but here's what happened. So it's a big, it's a big deal. It's a nuclear weapon was, uh, you know, a broken arrow. They call it broken arrow. They find the warhead, by the way, about 40 feet away from me. It land, hit the ground about 40 feet from me. Um, the concrete's laying five feet from me. Um, but anyway, they take the warhead back and, you know, but the first, but as soon as they could blame it on the technician, they said, there's nothing to worry about. The, the nuclear weapons are safe. 
everything's good, people. No, no worries. Is a, the mistake was on the worker. The mistake was on the worker. So but it the was explosion in explosion wasn't a nuclear explosion. No, no. It was an it explosion because of the gas that was coming out. It was all the, the fuel. fuels. Yeah. And then there's there's okay. uh, stage one with two fuels, oxygen, or, or, I'm sorry, hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. Stage two, not hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, maybe 50,000 gallons of fuel total that explode and then blow the nose cone into a million pieces. But the warhead was intact and um, laying in the ditch. And then they put it on a truck and hauled it out. Is that, a, is it, I mean, is that amazing that that thing didn't go off? Uh, not, not really, because the nuclear weapons are so safe. They have so many safety things. If, if one thing is out of line, if one thing in the series of dominoes is not correct, then it won't go off. There's so many safety systems in those nuclear weapons. That's why there's never been an accidental nuclear weapon explosion. Now, the movie Command and Control, he said, and kind of basically paint the picture that even if the odds are a million to one or a billion to one, you still have the one. And God forbid, right. if that would have went off, they said it would have killed 10 million people. But, but so picture me. That's where I was going with that. If that thing went off, what yeah. would have happened? And the government has to make sure that nobody realizes that because that's, that's what would scare the hell out of people. Oh, yeah. And they, they showed the kind of a fallout pattern of one that it did explode in the uh, 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 Bikini Atoll where they detonated one. And they showed that that, that pattern would be, if that pattern was similar, it would have killed like 10 million Americans. But they were, this they, was all underground, right? When this happened? This was underground, underground silo, yes. But the warhead wound up blowing out of the silo and it was laying in the ground over there. I'm missing something. You, you got blown 600 feet, but that uh, was no, underground. I, I got, no, I, I was about, so remember, we broke in by going in underground, but then they called us back to topside. And then oh, the two right. other guys went in and they were at topside when the thing exploded. So everybody was above ground when it exploded. So I slid 60 feet on my back. The nuclear or the uh, silo door went 600 feet out into the trees and the chunk, massive chunk of concrete, uh, which almost landed on me, uh, was about 80 feet away from this uh, silo door also so oh. you go to work one day and this is what happens at work essentially <laughs> right right and like it's hard to even believe that i mean i mean, I don't mean literally it's hard to imagine that this could happen to somebody and yes. then you have to go through six months of getting yourself back to well you know, of, of rehab and yeah. you began to tell and i have a i'm curious about how you felt based on how you were treated after that about laying your life on the line for the government which is basically what you did because there was no reason for you to have to do to have to suffer that way so so um i was really proud of what i did because i felt like i was defend you know, doing my part to defend the nation and uh, my job and even what i call the the kind of the beef with my uh, direct supervisors they were mad at our shop and were kind of treating this whole shop not so well and um so and then you know um, they a few things happened and they were kind of looked like they were trying out to get me. They were they were trying to take a stripe away from me. I mean, you know, uh, if you see the movie Command and Control, you'll see Jim Sandaker is saying, you know, they're treating them like crap. These guys are heroes and they're treating them like crap. But um, and and we didn't, um, Matt, we didn't think we. I don't think I don't consider myself a hero. I I went there. I was doing my job that day and the missile exploded. I just you know it just happened. It's just something that happened. You know. I didn't plan on getting blown up. You know, one guy died, David Livingston died. So, you know, um, a lot of people were injured. You didn't catch that. So one guy, one guy did lose his one life. One guy died, 23 people were injured. And, um, you know, that was kind of, then it actually wiped out the entire Titan II program because uh, back in 1987, they completely dismantled all of them, pulled the warheads off, pulled all the missiles out, blew the silos up, filled them in with gravel and all that stuff. So they're gone completely. Now we still stockpile those warheads, but, um, but anyway, so imagine a hundred mile an hour car crash, right? And then a Titan II nuclear missile explosion and not the nuclear part, but the missile exploded. Um, pretty, pretty harrowing. I mean, you know, and then you, they, you get the screams, you know, I, I'm telling you, Matt, if I wouldn't have heard those screams. I'd have been, I'd been the first and only guy killed on site. Because the guy that died died in the hospital twelve hours later, but uh, and you know I'd been killed right there on site. But because the, if I wouldn't have left that spot, that concrete would have landed on me. But so you so you take those pieces, I wind up with the most phenomenal job I ever had in my life, which was because it 
the shuttle, space shuttle, which was just starting, was using those similar fuels in the auxiliary power units and their thrusters uh, in space. So the same fuels that the Titan used. So there's, there's not a lot of places you can go to get a job working with hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, but right. that was one. Right. And then I go to the most amazing job of my life, working with the shuttle program, right? I plan a career. I'm going to be there. Man, this is awesome. This is where my career is going to be, right? Then I'm there for, they hire me. Um, love my job. I'm there five years. Challenger explodes on takeoff. It's like, oh no. They kind of shut the center down for about three years while they figured it out what was going on. And they laid off six guys in my shop. I was number six. I'm going, are you kidding me? Another explosion? Now, Matt, get this. Here's how ironic it was. The Challenger exploded on January 28th of 1986. January 28th. You know, the day they laid me off, the Titan II nuclear missile was September 19th, 1980. I was laid off on September 19th, 1986. <laughs> what the you heck? Have, God, your life what? has some really interesting <laughs> what are you doing here, guys? Like connections. Wow. But, but listen, if you, if you take it down the line, so, so you take this down the line a little bit. So then, and here's the connection. When we, my, my wife and I were young and we, so because we're married, they gave you a stipend in the, in the military, a little extra money because they know you have to either rent an apartment or something. So my wife and I at 19 bought our first three bedroom, one bath brick home, 19 years old. So anyway, um, the guy who lived next to us owned a big John 78 inch tree spade that used to dig 8,000 pounds of dirt of, with the root ball and move full grown oak trees. And I shouldn't say full grown, like 25 foot, 28 foot oak trees, uh, maple trees, that kind of stuff. So I said, man, I was in East coast of Florida and there weren't any of those tree spades around here. I thought maybe I'll go in that business, moving palms, oaks, maples, all this stuff. So I created a business called Tremendous, with two E's, Tremendous, <laughs> three, right? And uh, so I got these big spades and things are going good. And, and even the Kennedy Space Center even called me back. But I, my business, the, the tree business is doing so well. I was like, man, thank you so much for calling me back. But I love what I'm doing. I'm moving these big trees and, and, and it's a blast, right? So I'm moving trees. Well, in, in the tree business in Florida, you move thousands of palm trees, thousands. And we had a one-year guarantee. If any tree dies, we replace it. No questions asked. So I had one big fat, fat trunk cabbage palm, and I had pulled the stump out and gave him a new tree. And I'm, it's Friday afternoon. I'm exhausted. I'm coming back. I was going to go to the dump and drop it off. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to use that thing. I'm going to carve a tiki just for fun. I'm going to carve this tiki. And um uh, I don't know if you saw, let's see. Oh, I can't. I don't know if I had it here in the, uh, I don't know if I can share my screen with you, but I got some photos in there. I can you, show you, but you can't go ahead. Should I, uh, How do I do it? We're in let's Zoom. Share screen, share screen, yeah. click. Uh, yeah. Host disabled participant. Uh, Be careful what you're showing me, though. Hold on. Make sure it's the right picture. No, no. It's, hey, yeah, it's, no, it's all good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything bad there. So it says share. It says disab you disabled it, but I don't know. Oh, did I? Uh... And I don't have to share. Yeah, I don't want to start messing around with settings. I don't yeah, want to no lose worry. Don't, don't, don't sweat it. But, uh, but anyway, I carved this, uh, this tiki and uh, uh, just for fun. And I stuck it on the side of my house. Well, um, yeah, now, so go a little farther with me. All right. Go a little farther with me. So I'm in the tree business. Got that tiki stuck over there. It's been there a little while. And I'm going to work one day. I'm kind of in a hurry. And we're going, getting ready to go out the door. And I'm looking for my sunglasses. And I can't find my sunglasses. And I was like, man, where are my glasses? Well, let me show you where my glasses were at. Try and get these off there. So I have my sunglasses up here, right? In the top of my head. I'm in a scramble looking for my glasses. <clears throat> it's like, man, where are my glasses, right? So I grab another pair if I can find another. I grab a, a uh, oh, it's down there. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I grab a pair of glasses. They're the same color. They're orange, all right? Like mine here. So I say, oh, I see them on the desk. And I said, that's my glasses right there. I grab them, start to put them on, start to go out the door, right? And I got two pairs of glasses on. And, um, and they're both the same color, right? right and I right, think right. they were both green. But anyway, got these glasses on. And um, one of the guys works with me goes, hey, man, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, what's the deal with the double glasses? I said, what are you talking about? He said, 
you got a pair on your face and a pair on your hair. And I said, Matt, it was like a bell went off in my head. I went, that's it. That's the idea I need. And he said, what do you mean? He said, I said, uh, I'm going to create a concept of sunglasses called backups, a spare pair. I said, kids are going to have a pair here. They're going to have a pair here. We're going to put them on cords, right? So they hang around the neck. They can have multiple pairs of glasses. If you're at the beach and you see a cute girl and she didn't have glasses, say, hey, wait, I got a spare pair for you. So just an off the wall, goofy sunglass idea. So I create this called backups, a spare pair, trademark the name, copyright the stuff, get sunglasses brought in, you know, and uh, we got these glasses and we're on tour. I went to Cincinnati, surf Cincinnati. I was going to beach places. And now I'm on Florida's East Coast down here, beach shops and stuff. Put my glasses in there. So I'm promoting glasses, put them in Teen Beat Magazine, sunglasses, backup sunglasses, backups, right? Then I got this idea. I said, wait a second. I said this, I said, I'm going to use that tiki. Because Matt, where I live in Titusville uh, on Harrison Street, where we live, anytime a shuttle launched, as soon as the launch was over, 100,000 to 250,000 people would leave Titusville. They would, because they're on the East Coast, they go west toward Orlando and get on 95 or whatever, they're going back north. Well, anyway, they got to go out of here. So one of the exit paths was our street, Harrison Street. Hundreds of cars would go past my house during shuttle launches. So, I, and uh, if I can pull this tiki up real fast, I'm going to do it for you. Uh, um, so anyway, uh, I said, I'm going to use a tiki. So I pull the tiki out and I, I have heavy equipment. This thing weighs 1200 pounds, you know, takes my crane to move it and stuff. It's nine foot and buried about three foot. So anyway, stick this tiki out there. And uh, what I put the big sunglasses on his face and I painted bright neon colors. And Matt, what happened afterward was like, it was uh, stunning. I had family stopping by. Um, this is a tiki, by the way. See if you can see this. So can you see that tiki right there? Yeah. Yeah. So, so he's about six foot tall. He's got yeah. sunglasses on his face. Uh, so, so this tiki gets so much attention that I said, man, this is a country that had a teenage mutant ninja turtle that came to life in a New York City sewer. I said, I'm going to create a superhero series called Neon Tiki Tribe. We're going to give them laser powers out of their sunglasses, only we're going to make a better kids superhero. We want this. We want this to benefit society. So, initial concept was a nonviolent action hero, and then it evolved into an educational superhero series. So, I was kind of walking you through all those pieces, and you go because in the beginning, when I was a kid, I didn't say, "Oh, I want to be a kids' book writer." Or, I want to be, you know, and by, and I and I want to make sure I make this clear. When I say I, I have a business partner, Dave. He and I together have assembled an amazing team of writers and illustrators. We work with teachers. We work with police officers, firefighters. We say, what's the message you would want to get across in this story? So as a team, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of them, but this is a team effort. Um, and we just wanted something better for kids. But I almost think it's fate or destiny. I almost think it's from a, a divine intervention because it's hard to imagine that, you know, anybody could go, yep, I'm going to get blown up in a missile explosion. I'm going to, then I'm going to the space center. Then I'm going to do trees and that's going to accidentally lead to sunglasses, to tiki's, to neon tiki's. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's a crazy story, man. It really is. Well, you left something out along the way and yeah. it's, it's important. Yep. So when you guys, how, how old were you when you started having children? Like where, where did the kids so, come in? We actually went, so I was, my wife is 16. I had just turned 18 by three weeks when we got married. All right. We were in the service for four years. We actually waited five years to have kids. So, uh, so I was 23. She was 22 at the time um, is when we were working at the Kennedy Space Center. So I went, was there from 81 to 86 on the first run. And then I didn't uh, kind of tell you, you know, the, after the first Tiki's, this group and, uh, and the beanies and all that stuff, when this one failed went under what saved me was i was able to go back to work at the kennedy space center because that provided the income uh, on second shift and then my partner dave thompson he called me a year later or so and he said hey greg we just need to go back to the drawing board let's go back to the drawing board man something was missing in these tiki's and by the way if you look at the old tiki's i got the glasses off them now but see see how, see how many colors there are in them so i'll just show you mo of the great 
So the original mole was orange. Notice he's got purple hair, peat tongue, and all this stuff, right? I'm going to show you Dar. Now, see Dar. See the hair is uh, green, yellow, red, white stripes. See all the colors in them? So the, the only problem with colors like that, and see, with they have, by the way, if they have their glasses on their face, you can't, when someone has glasses on their face, you can't tell if they're happy or they're sad. You can't see their eyes, right? So, so when we went back to the drawing board, if you notice, see Dari Tiki, it's a little hard to see, but see how he's all green? He has a red cape? Yeah. See, he's easier for kids to distinguish, right? They have smiles on their face. Uh, like Moa the Great. So Moa's over here. But see, see the original Moa with the purple hair and all the different colors? Oh, yeah, interesting. Oh, all orange now. And Zeke is yeah, all yeah, blue because yeah. this, this was a Zeke Kiki. So he had the red hair, purple yeah. glasses. Now he's all blue. So we made them more kid friendly. We may put smiles on their faces. The project evolved and it kept getting better. And, um, you know, and, and we want to continue to do that. That's, and the way we do that is by working with um, parents and teachers and librarians and, and you know, um, society. We, we go out there and say, what, would, what do you think would be an, a great storyline for the Neon Tiki tribe? Because, you know, this this is way bigger than me or Dave. And, 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 you know, if we, I'd say this, if my business partner and I were on the shark tank right now and Mr. Wonderful saw, I said, uh, uh, you got 30 years in that and you're not profitable yet. No, he said, you're dead. He'd tell us we're dead to him. Right. But listen, this is big. This is bigger than money. It's it. This is society needs this man. Little kids need this. Families need this. So that's why we never gave up. And what's exciting about what we're doing, and this has kind of come in uh, um, literally in the last three months. Um, if you did, if you did use the term NFT, or now I've heard, I'm sure you've heard of cryptocurrency, of course, of course yeah, yeah. Bitcoin, Bitcoin and that kind of stuff. And and I, and I you know, uh, like I say, three months ago, I had I heard the term, yeah, you know, do I know anything about them? No, no, I couldn't even, I, I wouldn't even be a good guy to be represented, but. The digital world with Neon Tiki's gives us a few things. First is, because um, we're, we're looking, we're, we're, we're talking to a group right now. Uh, if we did a launch and, and uh, their thought was, if you do NFT drops, I do them in small, small quantities in the beginning. Um, the good thing about Neon Tiki's is, see, a lot of projects out there are purely artwork. So it's an artist, they've got drawings, they put them out, they make an NFT, um, they do the drop and they sell so many of them, right? But there's there's no storyline with them. There's no history to them. There's no, uh, one thing that's solid about Neon Tiki Tribe is 30 years of stories, 13 finished books. Uh, we're not going anywhere. We're gonna be here for, you know, exactly. we do the digital drop, but we, we really do visualize these in multiple languages. We visualize them as a, you know, Fortnite, a Roblox, uh, something kids could play, maybe where they could interact with them in those specific storylines. Um, I want to show you this too, because I don't think I showed it in the, in the very beginning. So our very first two books come together. This one's an explosive beginning. This is about making wise choices in life. Okay. And then this one is digging up adventure which is about battling boredom. Kids are saying, mom, I'm bored, I'm bored. Oh, wow, yeah, that's I'm great. To do something. But these two books actually tell the beginning of the antiques, but if you bring, it's, let me see if I can do this where it looks okay to you. But- uh, Oh yeah, look at that, that's cool. Yeah, the artwork yeah. comes together. Yep, yep. To make one big photo. Yep, So that's brilliant. Both these stories actually combine to tell the very beginnings of the Neon Tiki tribe, and they cover two, two neat aspects there. Um, one other one I wanted to show you was this one. Uh, so we did this with the Ronald McDonald House of India. Remember my business partner, Dave, he's in Indianapolis. So um, we got with the Ronald McDonald House up there and we got with, um, um, wait a second, Ronald McDonald House and the, uh, it's a children's hospital there, oh boy, Riley Children's Hospital, Riley Children's Hospital. And we wrote this book called Brave Hope Hospital. And there's no, uh, this is for children who are battling really tough illnesses, maybe even terminal illnesses. Because, you know, if someone gave your child a, hey, you have six months to live, 
oh my gosh, man, it just ripped, you know, what hope could you have? It ripped your heart out, you know? Um, this is probably my favorite book in the series. Um, gives me goosebumps reading it. And it's, it's, um, it's so that kids never give up. There's always an answer. There's always a way. Listen, new technologies are coming out. New, you know, new medicines are coming out. So don't give up. We all, we got today. Nope, we're fighting the battle. We got, we got, we're going to find a way to win when it looks hopeless. And this is a, re Matt, Brave Hope Hospital is a really good story. So, so, you know, those, I, those are some that are kind of like really get to me in our, in our series here, but uh, so I probably talk too much. I don't know if you want to ask any questions. No, or... no, I, 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 you, you just brought it to a perfect spot and you tell your story. Like it's just, it's a great story the way you tell it. I'm glad we don't usually do this. I'm glad we started with you with talking about what you're doing now and then went back and yeah. then came back again. Cause it was such a good way to hear your story. Right. right, right. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I jot the notes down like while, while we're doing these and, and I, the message that the message is that I've got that are, are the takeaways from this uh, all over your story is perseverance. Um, yes. I mean, it's not just about the, the, what your, 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 the Tiki you know, project. It's like everything, like your whole life is about perseverance. It is. Um, yeah. Making kids the, the, well, making sure kids know that they can reach their potential, like being the best that they can be. There's a yes. long list here, but something I picked up about you, it's really interesting. Loyalty, integrity, and your character yes. are really like, I, I mean, it's like impeccable. And uh, I, you didn't talk about that, but as I'm listening to you talk about the way you you um, would handle early investors and things, like that, that's, that's just who you are. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. The fighter and the golden gloves was really interesting because it weaves into all of this. That because I, even though you're you got a phenomenal spirit and you're optimistic, you are a fighter. Yeah. I mean, everything you're telling me is about being like a fighter, not giving up. Yeah. Hard work. There's the messages here, like hard work, don't give up. And you didn't talk about it, but everything you talked about without saying the words was about teamwork. It's about teamwork. It is about everything. Teamwork. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. While well, you're talking, this is what I'm doing. Teamwork, <laughs> man. Yeah. Up about you. It, it is true. Uh, um, and creativity, yeah. like it's My so important yeah to teach kids about to teach kids creativity and maybe they don't have it on the surface but everybody has the ability to be a creative thinker your level of creativity is way way next level like you're just a super super creative guy um and it's interesting because you didn't you always were that guy and, and we did run out of time and we didn't get to, to you as a child but you must have been a hell of a lot of fun as a kid <laughs> to hang out with because you must have been like just all kinds of fun games and stuff but it's interesting to see how your life went man it really really is but your your purpose is clear your passion is is like you can feel it right through the screen here yeah. and um and i hope that's what everybody takes away from this talk today it doesn't matter what happens to you you can overcome anything and you can you can achieve whatever you want to and in your case you're still working on it yes and you know i had a note here that that you um I guess at one point, you, the way you put it went broke, and, and but you you've been true to like you're, you're you're you just keep doing your thing. Okay, went broke, fine, do it again. Yes, you know, keep, keep and the keep persistence and the and, and the the perseverance is like a phenomenal message in your life. Yeah, phenomenal. Get so, off the floor, yeah. Get off the floor and keep swinging. Um, you know, don't, you're still you're still alive. Okay, you got knocked down. It's all right. It's all right. Regroup come back at it and sometimes you have to take a break I, I always tell kids if you were climbing to the moon let's say somebody had a ladder that would reach the moon and you say man i'm going to go to the moon and you start climbing that ladder somewhere along that journey you're going to be exhausted and then you're going to go oh my god i don't know if i can make it well no i when i tell people stop hang on take a break take a breather recuperate okay now you got a little wind back in you now look up you can go 10 more steps you can go 10 more. You can go. You can. Don't, you know, uh, they, they say that the three key words of success are never give up. And it's so true. But, yeah. but you know, so when do you, you know, it, if that's it, then is it 10 years, 20? Is it 30? What is your give up point? No, mine is no, never. I believe so much in this. Uh, my partner does too, and our team does. We believe so much in this that. Um, no, we believe that once the right 
pieces start to fall in place that a publisher will take the series eventually uh some you know the pe the right people will come on board and it'll slowly grow and take a life of its own that's what we're looking for to do is kind of take a life of its own where it starts to run where we're not necessarily the guys out there beating a the drum to promote it that people go wow have you heard about the neon tiki tribe look at that, what that did for my kids my my partner tells a neat story and this is a true story he had a book uh so we had one of our books the first one of the first one actually the first one we made was tiki beach battle had this book tiki beach battle right and this is a book about keeping the oceans clean the bad guys are dumping trash in the ocean because they got a resort there they don't care about the ocean or the turtles or any of that stuff right well anyway so this mother in indiana they, uh, David given her uh, one of the soft copy books. They had went on a, so she read that to him like on uh, Thanksgiving. Well, they went on a spring vacation. It was at the beach. And she said her five-year-old boy was, she said, we couldn't figure it out. He was so obsessed with not so much swimming, but picking stuff up off the beach. And then she said, what are you doing? He said, Kiki beach battle. We got to keep the beach clean. And Dave, Dave goes, oh my gosh, that got through to that little kid and to his mom and dad, and then wow, back to us. Wow. So picture that, you know, picture that by 10,000 yeah. or 100,000, whatever, That's you know? powerful. Oh yeah, very That's powerful. powerful. Yep. I, 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 I this, we could, we could probably keep going for a couple of we hours. We could talk for weeks, we probably. Could, we could. <laughs> um, I do have to end it here, but like yes. the, those messages are just, just keep doing what you're doing. It's going to come together. It's it just you got yeah. it's, it's exactly what you said it's going to happen when it's meant to happen but you're still every little thing that you're putting out somebody could see this somebody could it doesn't matter you just never know when it's going to be that one thing that catches it and it goes but that's yes. the reward for not giving up that's the reward for not giving up what right. i could say just before we end is that uh, uh if people really want to follow us and what's the latest happening we have a, t a neon tiki tribe on twitter so you go to twitter.com and neon tiki tribe Put those three words in you'll find us that's where kind of the we are we're running down a path and letting people know what's the latest we're bringing out and um and we have a website neontikitribe.com that's actually being rebuilt right now it exists you can go check it out now but it's being rebuilt right now so uh but twitter is where Tw neon tiki tribe on twitter is where you'll really find the latest on us so oh, that's awesome I'm, I'm glad you 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 went there we're going to put everything is going to be in the description down below when this video comes out so everything that you you have as far as reaching you as far as everything you just said we're going to make sure it's all down below and i mean i really hope that that people just come in and just look into you and just check it out and just get to know you it's uh it's pretty, it's pretty amazing talking to you it's amazing talking to you and matt you don't know how much we appreciate you inviting us on your show i mean oh, it's, well, thank you i appreciate seriously, you saying that seriously, you and i are gonna get together later for dinner or something so oh yeah well we'll meet up tomorrow <laughs> A Thursday. <laughs> wait, I'm going track of it. Oh, wait, today's only Tuesday. Isn't yeah, it? Tuesday's Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, Thursday. You're you right. told me Thursday, so you're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, Listen, so for everybody who 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 does watch this, I want to thank you all for watching. Uh definitely make sure that you hit the subscribe button down below and, and share this with all your friends, share it with everybody you know. It's a great message. Um, these are great stories. And um, I really I hope you enjoyed the show. And one thing that we always say at the end, and this story thankfully exemplifies it, is do the work, be humble, and hustle. And if you do that, you definitely will reach your potential. If you yeah. don't do it, you're not going to know what your potential is. Right. But thank you again for coming on. Thank you so much. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care.